Hi, my name is Bob Vinia, and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So is everyone awake after their lunch today? Yeah. Don't see anyone asleep out there, there's one over there. Okay, so I want to thank the organisers of ICCF 22 for uh, inviting me to present Alexander's work. Alexander unfortunately couldn't come, his doctor advised him to not get or do anything that's too exciting. <laughs> so I know you're all excited. Um, but anyway, so yes, the nickel hydrogen heat generator continuously working for seven months. So this, this data was available just before ICCF 21, but the analysis of the reactants hadn't been done, and so it's better that it's presented here uh, to give a better picture. So, uh, the peculiarity of this reactor is that it stopped working, not because of the burnout of the heater, as it was until now with all of its other previous reactors, but in the process of smooth reduction of excess heat as a result of the depletion of the energy resource of the fuel. In total, 4.2 gigajoules of excess energy was produced, more than 2 MeV per 1 atom of nickel. The maximum excess power is 1,020 watts, COP3.6, and the average excess power is about 220 watts average CO3 1.6. The reactor operated for 225 days, and the fuel was PNK OT2 nickel. Now, we analyzed this in many locations. It was sent to many labs, and this is Bob Higgins' stereographic image, which is just off the shot there. I think I'm going to lose a lot of titles, but anyway, sorry about that. Uh, so if you blur your eyes and squint in the middle, you might see it in 3D. This is fun. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so, uh, the preliminary operations, uh, and if you want to know really what you should do with uh, any uh, material that you want to occlude hydrogen with, you need to go back to Thomas, FR, uh, Thomas Graham, FRS, from 1867, who defined what you needed to do. And essentially, it is, as Pian Telly says, you need to absolutely clean the surface of nitrides and oxides. And uh, in his paper accompanying this, uh, he uh, describes the process here, uh, and essentially it's a case of uh, loading it below the center temperature of these wonderful structures you see here. Uh, and uh, you, you need to sort of pump in and pump out uh, with hydrogen for a number of cycles and uh, re reduce the oxides and so forth, then leave it to soak for a period of time for three days at temperature of 350 degrees C. Then after re oh, there we go. Uh, then after repeating the pumping cycle twice more, uh, he filled the, re the reactor uh, and heat generator was moved from the preliminary preparation area stand to the main workstation. So this is the components of the reactor before it ran. Uh, so uh, these are silicon bungs that go into the end. Uh, these are, uh, as I found out, uh, silicon dioxide uh, foam uh, here as well. And this separates the various components, and there's some things that you don't see in here that which we'll see when it's uh, broken up at the end, um, and we will move forward. Okay, so... <laughs> okay. Um, Hello. Um, okay, so the heat pipe was comprised of the tungsten wire, and the reason it's in, in this area here is that tungsten starts to oxidize, uh, you know, 800 or 1,000 degrees C, so this is a hydrogen atmosphere in this whole area here, uh, and it's spiral wound in the luminal tube. It has to have a lot of coils because it's got a low resistance. Uh, uh, between the fuel pipe and the heat pipe was a junction of tungsten ring and thermocouple, so that's this point here. Uh, a chrome aluminum uh, thermocouple was monitoring the temperature on the outside here. Uh, heat resistant silicon dioxide felt washers, as I just described, are here, here, and uh, for the other side, that's a mirror. And uh, the ends of uh, the 50% alumina and 50% mainly silicon dioxide outer tube are insulated from the atmosphere with silicon sealant here and here, and a metal tube comes from the ends of the reactor to connect to the monomanator here. Uh, I'm going to skip over this, but basically the secondary winding has a 630 watt uh, capacity. He switches between power, the volts and amps are measured here. He has a thermometer on the inside, a thermometer control on the outside with a TPM 500, pressure gauge and a, a Geiger Muller counter, and it's all computer controlled and recorded. He has a power monitor here. This is the actual setup you see with the ammeters and voltmeters and so forth. 
uh, you've got a power watt meter down here, and this is a temperature controller, very out, and so forth. Uh, you can look at this in your own time, and it's in the paper. Okay, this is where I have to get detailed. So, during the first day, the electric current heating power gradually increased, which was accompanied by a smooth increase in the temperature inside the heat generator to a temperature of about 1,100 degrees C at a power consumption of 400 watts. Further increase of power up to 700 watts led to heating up to 1,500 degrees C and the appearance of heat generation in excess of consumed electric power of about 130 watts. After reduction of the electric heating capacity to the previous level, uh, the excess heat generation capacity after uh, decreased to 80 watts, and the ratio of heat generating capacity to electric power consumption (COP) remained at the level of 1.2. The methodology for determining the excess capacity will be discussed later. Uh, subsequently, at the constant power cons uh, consumption uh, uh, over 18 hours, the temperature inside the reactor increased from 1200 to 1500 degrees centigrade, and the COP changed from 1.2 to 2.3. An increase in electric heating power up to 700 watts led to a short rise in temperature to 1800 watts, and an increase in COP to 2.7. But after that, the same power of electric heating the temperature and the COP decreased sharply. After about two hours, the temperature returned to its previous value of 1800 degrees C, and such a high temperature was maintained even after the electric heater power was reduced to 400 watts. At the same time, the power of excess heat generation exceeded 1000 watts, and that's where this 1020 watt comes from, and the COP value reached 3.6. Such high values persisted for about six hours, then the decline began, and a day later, at a constant power of electric heating, the temperature dropped to 1300 degrees C, and the excess up to 200 watts. So is everyone following what I'm saying? No! Read it later. <laughs> okay, so uh, in this one, <laughs> thank you Ruby, um, further operation of the heat generator from 14th uh, of October to 23rd of May 2018 uh, took place in electric heating power that varied from 350 watts to 380 watts. So what he's talking about here is this sort of wibbly power here. Um, that's due to some fluctuations in uh, the domestic power supply, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, these controlling increase, sorry, uh, the, the exception was a few short-term increases in heating power. These control increases, except for the last one on May the 17th, uh, where's the 17th of May? Somewhere over here. Oh no, I've gone forward. Um, uh, 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 no, I've lost it. Uh, led to an increase in the temperature and COP. An increase in power on May the 17th also led to an increase in temperature, but the COP value remained close to one, which indicated that the resource of the heat generator was exhausted. So they tried to like uh, increase some power here, but it went down to a COP of one. So that basically it died. Uh, despite the fact that the electric heating power uh, uh, varied within small limits, the parameters characterizing the operation of the heat generator changed significantly. A gradual spontaneous decrease in temperature inside the heat generator and excessive heat production, which lasted until October 13, was replaced by that uh, by growth that lasted until October the 18th. The temperature increase uh, reached 1550 degrees C, the power of the excess uh, heat increased to 550 watts, COP of 2.5. After this, there was again a decline followed by a gradual increase which continued until mid-December. From mid-December to mid-March, the temperature inside the reactor varied between 1300 and 1400 degrees C, and the power of the excess heat gradually decreased from 300 watts to 200 watts, and the COP value decreased from 1.9 to 1.5. Okay, this is all in the paper, um, and you can follow it through, and every single part of the chart that you need to look at is in there also. So, hydrogen pressure. Uh, the initial pressure was close to atmospheric. During initial heating days, uh, it went to nearly one bar over pressure, which was vented to the atmosphere, the atmosphere via a valve. From the third day onwards, pressure fell below atmospheric, stabilizing at, stabilizing at 0.8 bar uh, two months later. On March the 16th, hydrogen was added to the heat generator to a pressure close to atmospheric. So he did add some hydrogen. 
This led to a slight increase in temperature and excess heat. The COP value increased from 1.5 to 1.7, but then excess heat began, power began to fall at an accelerating rate. An attempt to revive the heat generated on Lady 8 by a second addition of hydrogen, he added hydrogen again, uh, and an increase in the power of electric heating did not produce significant results. On May the 14th, the generation of heat, uh, excess heat, ceased. So from my point of view, this is a really great experiment because I don't know many that have gone from nothing to excess heat for a very, very long period of time, back down to nothing. I think it's a very significant event uh, in Lena history. Uh, okay, so heating power determination. Uh, input power is easy to calculate from DC or low frequency AC with modern devices. Uh, flow or evaporation calorimetry he considered to be impractical for an experiment of this length, 225 days. Curve fitting was used, uh, starting with Stephen Boltzmann law, and was based on empirical data published during calibration with a resistive heater. Heating powers required to reach stable temperatures at a certain point in the device were recorded after the 20 to 30 minutes required to reach thermal equilibrium. Okay, so you can see here, uh, uh, he is the actual reactor. Uh, what he did was he ran it up to, from experience he knows that he didn't get any excess heat below uh, 1000 degrees C. So the initial calibration was running the reactor up to uh, 1000 degrees C up here. It's not so clear on here, these colors don't really stand out, but up to 1000 degrees C. So those are the initial calibration curves. Uh, and he used that to form the polynomial curve uh, here uh, to predict the, the temperatures of higher, higher regimes of input power. And then uh, above the confirmation uh, and, uh, and below were recorded after the fuel was exhausted. So what he did is when, when, the, the, when the excess heat of the reactor went to zero, he then used the exactly same device to see what the temperature would be as, as he put the power up, and also he, he also put the power down. So it, the post-excess heat regime followed the same curve even uh, in post calibration. So uh, this is some determining some excess heat. So measurements during operation before fuel was exhausted show uh, no excess heat below 1,000 degrees. So these are uh, measurements during uh, uh, the active run. So up to 1,000 degrees is no excess heat, but as you go above 1,000 degrees, it starts to deviate over here, and you determine your excess heat for the diff difference here. At higher temperatures, the measurement results are located below the calibration curve, which indicates the presence of it, uh, heat generation. This is the yield calculation. I think you want to take a shot of that, because I, I don't believe anyone, so I do my own that. So, ah, this is the PowerPoint, moving things around. Okay, analysis of isotopic and element changes in fuel and structural materials. Essentially, there was no change in the nickel isotopes. Uh, uh, looked at Synthestec, scientific research in Sochi, and uh, Uppsala University in Sweden, and that's the case for all of our Alexander Park and Moss reactors. They haven't observed a nickel isotope change. However, Synthestec did see a lowering of 61 nickel ratio, but this wasn't confirmed at uh, uh, Uppsala. Uh, there was no changes in the tungsten. Oh dear, sorry about this. <laughs> Um, analysis of this, the elemental composition of the samples taken from different places from the heat generator was made at Synthestet and uh, Amteret LLC by MG Dispersive X-ray Fluorescence Spectroscopy. And he observed a wide range of uh, elements, uh, both uh, being synthesized in the bulk of the blob in the middle of the reactor and in the outer sort of central core of the reactor. So he was seeing uh, vanadium, gallium, uh, cobalt, strontium, deuterium, hafnium. Now, I can say in the previous reactor, we actually, uh, Alan Goldwater and I, uh, in a university, Masaryk University, we tested this part, and this is from the 400 megajoule reactor. We tested this from the previous fuel, and we also observed gallium-69 in that by using moldy top MS. So here's the mess afterwards, and there's all kinds of uh, detail on what was where, but you can see here, these two end pieces, and we were actually given one of these end pieces and a fragment of this. Uh, this is the central core, and this goes inside, and, and the tungsten reunion uh, uh, thermocouple goes in between the two here and sits under this point. 
he had to crack this open. You can see where the wire was holding the or, uh, thermocouple on the outside. But we actually have this bit. I have it here in my pocket. If anyone wants to have a look at it later. Um, so we analyzed this at the Magic Sound Lab, courtesy of Alan Gordwater. And uh, if you have samples that you need testing and you want to be open about it, Alan can provide a service at extremely uh, reasonable rates, so you can understand what's going on in your reactor. But essentially, there's lots of things we found. Firstly, we found these fibers of carbon, and also fluffy carbon. Uh, and so we're actually looking into some things that came out of the core, and also a big blob here. And in this blob, we found nickel, copper, tin, and lead. Obviously, you're going to see nickel. The interesting thing is, there was silicon in large abundance. Uh, also, you see calcium here. Um, and a lot of carbon. So, uh, where's that carbon coming from? Uh, we also found uh, these platelets. Uh, so, this is the fluffy type of carbon, and these platelets, and they had iron, chrome, and calcium in them. This is another area you can see these uh, thin fibers, and these kind of fibers were observed being produced in the Claire's cavitation experiments. Again, we've got chromium, iron, and calcium. I call this the pretzel, um, and we've seen these kind of structures uh, in various experiments that we've looked at over the last couple of years, and it seems to be quite an important structure. On the back side, you can see this sphere at this point, which is, I think, at this point on the back side. It's actually physically quite large, and you can see these bands of fluffy carbon. And so uh, we're seeing a lot of calcium silicon uh, here, but it's the calcium I think is interesting. So I asked, uh, I did some calculations using the Alexander Parker Mod Reaction Table System that the MFMP has developed with Philip Power, and uh, looking at starting with uh, hydrogen isotopes and with a neutrino on the left here, we can end up with carbon. So I put this to Alexander Parker Mod. You know, you've got nickel, you've got hydrogen, you've supposedly got an, an alumina. Uh, reactor here uh, and some silicon dioxide uh, uh, felt is, where is all this massive amounts of carbon in fluffy and fibre things coming from? And this is the answer I got back. The large amount of silicon and carbon in the reactor is not surprising, since the inner tube which uh, nickel was located consists of silicon carbide. Okay, so this is not disclosed until now. This material can withstand significantly higher temperatures than alumina. The inner tube is inserted into the alumina tube in which the tungsten wire heater is wound. The outer tube contains 50% alumina, the rest is mainly silicon dioxide. The heat insulating center washers consist, and that's where the detail comes from. So, uh, we've got some notes here, and the first one is, this is thermometry, and so you have the thermometer here, and Alan Goldwater discovered when we were doing the uh, glow stick experiments, when, when we had a heater wire here and a heater wire here, and we had it on the alumina, um, that uh, if we had a thermocouple in the middle, what happened was over a thousand degrees, alumina, which this outer sheath is, we now know is, um, it becomes a conductor. And this is the basis of the Nernst lamps, where you had a ceramic that becomes a, con uh, a conductor. And we found that we had leak currents. And could that explain the excess heat? Uh, but however, the, the effect could lead to uh, leakage current artifact, but the, the fact that he used the same reactor over, with the input power ranges and, and saw the same temperatures down here and the same temperatures up here in post-calibration negate the potential, the potential of this. Uh, second note is that silicon uh, carbide is often doped with boron, and the XRF technology that they use uh, wasn't able to detect uh, boron, and he makes a point that it, it's in his paper that it can only see aluminium. The interesting thing is, in the previous reactor, he actually suggested that the core actually had boron in it. Uh, and this is interesting because Alexander Shishkin is saying that um, uh, string vortex silicons interact with boron, and we saw excess heat only when we, when we had boron in our uh, aura silica glass when we were doing Chilani replications, and there's boron in the center of the Piantelli reactor, and there's boron in some other reactors that people might like to admit in this room. Uh, so, uh, using the same reaction calculator, uh, proposing that 
Uh, if there is boron in there, boron can go to neon, and then neon can fuse to calcium. That is one way to explain the calcium, but of course tungsten can fish into calcium as well, so maybe it's coming from that. This may be unlikely because of the way that the, these elements that have been synthesized have come from the inner tube and out. Thank you. Nearly there. So the conclusion, optimization of the design, the use of more heat resistant structural materials and reliable sealing made it possible to achieve a seven month duration of operation of the nickel hydrogen heat generator with excess power of a lot. Uh, during the process uh, that took place uh, in the heat generator, there were changes in the elemental composition, which I've been through, and significant changes in the isotopic com composition of nickel as well as tungsten were not detected. And these are the people that Alexander would like to thank. If you have any questions, I'm ready to take them now. Good day. Um, you should be aware, and I am from a fortunate first-hand experience, that you take a tungsten rhenium um, thermocouple up to 1800 degrees, which uh, was done early on, that when you have carbon around, you make tungsten carbide, and the thermocouple is no longer reading correct from there on. Uh, that's a very good and valid point. Uh, it did read the same temperatures as it read well below in post calibration, so maybe that mitigates the point, and I don't know. You know, I, I guess the outer thermocouple um, had, I don't have the data of the outer thermocouple, I think it is in the charts there, um, but I think that also would follow the expected regime beforehand, but no, no, that's as it is. Yeah. Bob? Very nice presentation. I may have missed it. Is the hydrogen ordinary or isotopically pure? It's ordinary hydrogen. I have a question regarding the uh, consumed fuel. So um, the conclusion was that the uh, fuel was consumed at the end of the excess heat generation. Now what was really consumed? There was nickel at the end still available. The hydrogen was refilled. Um, what, what element was consumed? So um, there's a many hypothesis. Uh, what we do know is that the calcium went from less than 1% to around about 20% in the inner heater tube, which we now, through forcing the situation and doing our own analysis, is, was actually silicon carbide. Like I say, he makes a point of saying that he could not see in the analysis of that inner tube that there was uh, anything below aluminium, and we, we have been told that his previous reactor to that reactor can, it contained boron, but yet we've actually got to confirm that. <laughs> it may not be boron, is what I'm saying. Um, but whatever it is, it, it stopped producing excess heat. Oh, thank you very much. Very nice presentation and very interested in your talk. Um, yeah. I have a question about the uh, calcium you detected. Uh, did you uh, measure the uh, isotopic anomaly or something like that? What I can say is, mm -hmm. I have some in here, mm -hmm. and we can, mm -hmm. but we have not yet. Okay. And in fact, they should have measured it at Synthes Tech. They may have that data, but it's not public. But we have some material here, now that we understand the calcium is important, to be able to potentially measure that. Okay, good. Thank you. I'll get two pieces. Well, I have two questions. First, what kind of nickel does it use? <laughs> it's on slide three. <laughs> you, you've even had about four grams of it. The, the same stuff we gave you in Padua. If I go back to the beginning, exactly the same stuff, PKNO2, that I showed you the picture. How did I get to the beginning? Uh, you'll get there. Uh, yeah, I'm getting there. Yeah. The second question is. So it is carbonyl nickel to answer your question, and it's a Russian made carbonyl nickel. The second question is if you go to 800, 800 centigrade, it's all melted. It, it, it starts right? to center at 450 degrees, that's not the point. So what happens at 800 degrees? 800, hmm? What's happening at 1800 degrees? Well, if there is boron in the reactor tube, uh, uh, nickel will interact with uh, boron at 1400 to 1600 degrees. 
um, and it may withdraw it out. But that was when I was looking at something that was not silicon carbide, so I, I haven't done. But the nickel will be melted. Yeah. And it was, you can see it's a big blob at the end. So I think you set up a scenario where something is made and it can do work, and it can do work preferentially at temperatures over 1100 degrees centigrade. Definitely not below 1000 degrees centigrade. Yeah. Okay. Because the melting point of nickel is 1532. Oh no, but it centers, because you look at, look at the dendritic structure, well, not the very fine peaks you've got here. That everything's not going to be at the bulk temperature. You're going to have extremely high temperatures on the, on, the, on the tips. And that may be playing a role in setting up whatever is doing the work later down the line. And once it's in the system, the nickel really isn't playing that much of a role. But this is a hypothesis. Oh, just uh, yes, Peter. Just a simple question. So did we measure only the thermal <coughs> temperature? That's it. Uh, he measured uh, radiation uh, counts. I, I, I don't know if there's anything on there, but I don't think it was anything serious. Yeah, because uh, if you think about the, some kind of a heavy, heavy nuclear, heavy nuclear fusion, they should measure at least the gamma. Yeah, you would have thought so, uh, but it would seem that there's been lead synthesized. Le lead has been synthesized by Adamenko, and there was radiation concomitant that with that. But unfortunately, he synthesized radioactive elements at the same time, and, and lead was synthesized with, with, with the Leclerc in a di completely different system. But again, he got radiation because he was synthesizing transuranic. So um, these are not surprising. This is a gentle system, and so maybe in this system, with whatever is playing the role of doing the excess heat generation, it's not actually generating really heavy elements that then fission and produce radiation. No, they have, <coughs> the reaction should make, make a uh, unstable nuclear. Well, so uh, the way Alexander Parkhamov uh, explains it in his theory, which I will do in a poster session, the poster will hopefully be up by Wednesday, um, uh, he's essentially saying that over a thousand degrees uh, in a metal and a liquid, uh, not a gas, in a gas the uh, likelihood of this interaction is seven orders of magnitude lower. So in a metal and a liquid, you have this massive potential of synthesis of uh, ultra-low energy neutrinos. And they're, they're formed in pairs, neutrino and neutrino, and these play a role in reverse beta electron processes. And you basically end up with uh, synthesis of elements, uh, either 2 to 1, 1 to 2, and 2 to 2, and that's a gross simplification of the process, because it is a correlated lump format, and they all do stuff at the same time. Um, uh, but uh, certainly the calculator that we have, which I will be able to take anyone's data through, is rudely good at predicting outcomes. I'm interested in the hydrogen. So in previous experiments, the hydrogen started out as uh, lithium aluminum hydride. Is that the same situation here? Okay, so uh, I, I can speak to that because we had some experience in Bang. We had an explosion with our very first test where we put lithium aluminium hydride into, a, into a, that nickel, that exact nickel, into a uh, reactor. Actually, no, it wasn't. It was a different type of nickel. But anyway, it was a similar kind of structure but slightly more filamentary. Um, and when we looked at the aftermath of that, uh, in fact, it was the storms that looked at it, uh, the lithium hand uh, covered these wonderful surfaces that have a potential to do some goodness. Uh, and uh, it, subsequently, having done very many experiments that failed, Parkhamov concluded that the lithium actually stops the nickel from performing the process that actually creates the thing that does the work. So how does the hydrogen get in? Is it gas he's got that, and he puts gas in. It's, just nickel, it's and nickel and hydrogen, it's PNT. And, and so you can, I mean, do you refresh the hydrogen? Or so in, in my talk uh, and in the paper, he specifically notes that he tries to add hydrogen at two separate points in order to see if he can revive the excess heat. So what he's trying to do is find out whether it's the hydrogen that's important. But of course, at that stage, the, the nickel isn't in this state, it's more in the blob state. So it probably can't build more of the active structure that does the work because it hasn't got the facility to do it because it's not like that anymore. So in the Piantelli experiment, the hydrogen would be flow, flowed through? Well, he did pressure pulses, but Piantelli yeah. did shock pulses, he did laser pulses. Okay. Everything's in his valid patent until uh, 2032. Uh, Piantelli, this is something that Piantelli hasn't disclosed, and I think it's important because it's, it speaks to what um, 
Francesco Cellani is doing, and where there is a lot of mistakes being made in this field, based on what works, what we've seen work, is that in his pattern he has uh, the platinum heater wire is much much higher density at one end and then it goes down to almost nothing. This creates a heat gradient, and he specifically shows us the reactive the the nickel, and it's only a very specific point on that the, uh, piece of nickel that gets hot, and then it moves along as the temperature goes up. Okay, and so you, there's doesn't seem to be much different in excess heat production below melting point, above melting point of the nickel, or? No, uh, actually his theory specifically states, and his observation. I was going to say, yeah. it's just the observation, not the... Okay, so, so the observation is that nothing really happens, and t there's a little effect below, sort of a thousand degrees, but basically essentially nothing happens at all, to a thousand degrees. And then as you go higher and higher, it gets very much bigger. And finally, the pressure of the hydrogen? The, the pressure of the hydrogen started off around atmospheric, uh, it went to a bit above, then it went below, and it stayed at about 0.8, and then he repressurized it. What was the size of the, of the carbon? The is carbon, it's a nanotube or? I'm willing to share all of, we have a lot more SEM uh, imagery. It is in, the, the very thin nanofibers that are really quite long, and then, if I, if I go to the, the because my want to be good, you know, to check the crystal structures, might be a new polymorph of carbon, which would be very interesting. It's, it's absolutely mad what it is. I don't know what it is. Uh, so it would burst the check. <laughs> so you can see here. This is actually the large sticks you're seeing are the uh, segments of the silicon dioxide wool that was used to separate all of the components. Okay. And the fluffiness that you see here is 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 this weird fluffy carbon, uh, and and here this is the you can see these fibers over here, and these are very similar to the fibers that were synthesized in the Claire's reactor in terms of morphology. Uh, yeah, could you show me again the, the nickel uh, slider? Uh, with the isotopes. No, 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 the, 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 the mad slide of the nickel, how, how it is. Because there is a, a white bar which seems to indicate 20 this? micron length, right? Sorry, what? So, this one? The, the, yeah, that one, yeah. The white bar is 20 micrometers length? Yes. All the white bar? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And so each one of those is 2 microns. Okay, so. Uh, and then it's subdivisions. Uh huh, okay. So, uh, as I have some background in uh, uh, catalysis in organic chemistry, and especially using organometallic catalysts, it's well known that the, the activation of a catalyst may occur when the, the atoms are and so there is a deactivation of the catalyst. So, you are running with a catalytic reaction. And my question is, could it be possible to add something in this nickel, on this nickel, to avoid maybe the, 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 the clustering of the of the material? Um, maybe, yes. Some uh, nanoparticles or things like that. Well, I think people have done that in the past by putting in things like zeolites and stuff and uh, looking at ways to separate the, the active like structure. So imagine if you got some zeolite and you managed to get some water with these nickel particles in and you float it through, it would capture some of them and then they would be maybe enough separated. But I think when you're getting up to well beyond the melting point of nickel, it's really academic. You're always going to get it melting. Alexander is, a, um, is an expert at um, uh, radiologic uh, measurement, gamma measurement. Uh, yeah. Did he share any measurements uh, during that very, very, very long experiment? Uh, there is. A, um, uh, observation uh, by a uh, gigolo uh, of strange radiation, um, but there's some debate about whether that is there or not, and, and so that's something that we need to maybe address. But uh, strange radiation may cause secondary radiation that looks like normal radiation that we understand and generally talk about. Um, so he, he, apparently there was strange radiation observed from this reactor as, as well as the the woodpecker reactor. So maybe just a question. Um, so can I just do one follow-up point on that? Um, 
uh, Baron Moss and Zasalepin ceased working on powder reactors uh, because they had a very large powder reactor and they prepared it maybe in a similar way to it as Parker Mothers described here and they loaded it with fresh hydrogen and at that point the entire lab filled with strange radiation so they decided basically until we understand that they're not going to look at it again what do you call strange radiation? I, I don't see that. <laughs> well, the, the, the only thing that's been really well studied uh, is about the work by uh, Alexander Shishkin and the team of about nine scientists at Dubna Science City. And they've observed these bird structures uh, on, on x-rays. And this has also been observed at the Moscow Physics Laboratory uh, by Bogdanovich uh, using plasma discharges. And he concludes because they can carry uh, nuclei of atoms out of something through metal that it has to be a neutral structure and it masks the, the charge and inertia and then when it gets into an x-ray plate they actually have, have seen and characterized pits both the diameter of the pit and the depth of the pit that's based on the atoms that have been captured by the string vortex soliton as it's traveled through a gas or a metal or something so you, and they've actually well characterized so if it goes through nitrogen with a factor you see the depth and the width of the pit here on the x-ray so, um, just two questions. Um, we use a uh, uh, constant time, nickel nickel kappa. Inside uh, the chip class sheet is a boron silicate, it's boron calcium. So, when uh, sometimes we make some mix uh, analysis, and we found the nickel made like a alloy. So, it changed everything. So, uh, yeah, so uh, what do you have to, go, to consider point? on the same point? You can have uh, segregation and so on. So yeah. the, the metric point can change just because local alloy. Yeah, and, and I mean it, 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 the alloy can happen at a distance as well. So um, as I was just saying with with uh, Mathieu, uh, that you can get the transport of material to other places in the reactor. And it, for instance, I didn't show it here, but in the outer sheet. The, the very outer sheet, we have spheres of iron synthesized, maybe synthesized, but we've got spheres of iron inside the large chunk of spheres of iron inside the, the, the actual ceramic sheet. Uh, extremely sorry, you interrupt the discussion, but we are, are asked to go for a coffee break. So if anyone wants to ask any other questions or see the samples, they're welcome to.